in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. For the last 150 years, the opening verses of the Bible have been the subject of considerable controversy and volatile debate. The battleground is the creation narrative recorded in the book of Genesis. Science and religion are pitted against one another. Science claims to have fact, while religion claims to have faith. The truth is, both opinions are based on fact and faith. The goal of this documentary is not to wade into the quagmire of this debate, but to present another point of view in support of the religious interpretation of the biblical narrative. In the first chapters of Genesis, we read how God and Adam walked together in the cool of the day. We also read about the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. On the surface, these descriptions seem strange. In fact, they seem mythical. I understand how our secular critics could view the Eden narrative as a myth similar to other Sumerian myths such as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Should the Genesis narrative be only a description of a physical location situated somewhere in present-day Iraq, then our critics might be right. Let's not limit our thinking to such a one-dimensional view. What if the Eden narrative is not describing a one-dimensional experience between God and Adam, but describing a two-dimensional experience? This is a controversial idea. Could there be more than one physical dimension? Dr. Stephen Hawking, the great theoretical physicist, supports such a theory. This multiple-dimensional hypothesis is called string theory. One of the theoretical foundations of this theory is the belief in extra dimensions that run parallel with our physical world. Some physicists who support this hypothesis project that the universe contains as much as 26 space-time dimensions for the bosonic string and 10 dimensions for the superstring. Again, the goal of this documentary is not to enter the dueling ground of this debate, but to present one simple fact. Even science supports the theory of more than one physical dimension. Could the Genesis narrative be a description of a dual dimensional experience? Does the Bible support this interpretation of events? Let's see.
we read in Genesis chapter 2 that God referred to his Eden creation as a garden, and that in the midst of this garden we see the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Where is the tree of life and the garden of God? Does our doctrine only allow it to exist somewhere in Iraq? Or could the Eden narrative be describing a dual-dimensional experience between God and Adam? When God flooded the earth, did he also flood the Garden of Eden? Did he also cover the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with water? There is no record in the Bible that God relocated these trees. Therefore, we must conclude that the trees were flooded, or the location of his garden and these trees are not in Iraq. Let's trace the garden of God and the tree of life through the Bible. Ezekiel, the Old Testament prophet, alludes to the fact that Eden is the garden of God. Should this be true, then where is the garden of God? Jesus also understood that a spiritual dimension exists referred to as the paradise of God. The Apostle Paul supports Jesus' declaration. He also received the revelation that the paradise of God and the third heaven are linked. John the Evangelist in the book of Revelation records that the tree of life is in the midst of the paradise of God. We also read that the tree of life is located in the center of New Jerusalem. Clearly, this location does not occupy time and space in our physical dimension at this time. All of these references support the hypothesis that the Genesis narrative is a description of a dual-dimensional experience. According to my theory, the Eden of God would have two dimensions, each overlapping the other, one being the physical and the other the spiritual. The physical dimension would occupy a location somewhere between the four rivers referred to in Genesis chapter 2, while the spiritual dimension would comprise the spiritual garden of God. In order to develop the theory of a dual-dimensional Eden, we must journey back in time to the primordial world of the first chapters of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and out of the dust and clay of the earth, God formed a new living soul he called Adam. Notice that this type of creation was a living soul. This is an important fact, since the soul is the heart of man. We also read in Genesis that Adam was made in the image of God, who is spirit. And we also know that Adam had a physical body. From these simple facts, we can conclude that Adam had three necessary elements, 
He was a creation of God who had a physical body, a soul, and a spiritual body. So, God made Adam with a body, soul, and spirit. Why is this important? We read in the first epistle to the Corinthians that all human flesh is made in the likeness and image of Adam. This fact must be made perfectly clear. We all have a body, soul, and spirit. Why should we be concerned with this truth found in the Bible? Through these bodies, Adam could experience two dimensions at one time. With his physical body, Adam experienced the water and earth of the Garden of Eden, located on planet Earth, while with his spiritual body, Adam walked with God in his garden, the spiritual paradise. Let me create a visual picture of this process. Adam has a body, soul, and spirit. Envision that each of these elements is a circle that partially overlaps the central circle. The left circle represents Adam's physical body, while the right circle represents his spiritual body. The central circle symbolizes Adam's soul. These three elements form the complete Adam. We know that the physical body has five senses of sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell that we use to acquire data about our physical surroundings. Consider this possibility, that our spiritual body also has the same five senses that we use to acquire data about our spiritual surroundings. We now have two bodies capable of interaction with their respective dimensions. Now we come to the reason for the soul. Is it possible that God designed the soul to be the central processing unit of the complete man? Like a central processing unit in a computer, the soul is designed to process the data coming in from all the various ports of entry. When Adam walked with God in the cool of the day, he walked in two dimensions. With his physical body, he strolled through the earthly Eden, while with his spiritual body, he walked with God in God's eternal paradise, the spiritual counterpart of Eden. Adam's access to the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the spiritual paradise of God, while Adam interact with the animal life of Eden through his physical body. Together, God and Adam enjoyed spiritual relationship. But a break was coming because God restricted Adam from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's read. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. All actions have consequences. Should Adam eat from this tree, he would die. 
We all know the story. Adam did eat from the tree, but did he die? In my opinion, death began to work on Adam immediately. His physical body began to age while death eroded his spiritual man. The time came when God walked through his garden but couldn't find Adam. Let's read. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man, Where are you? Why did God have difficulty finding Adam? One answer to this question is that Adam died to the spiritual dimension. And God and Adam were no longer walking together in paradise. Adam hid from God in the physical Eden, and among the trees God found him. I believe this event displays the true consequence of sin, and that result is death. Let me explain. Death is not obliteration or non-existence. Death is separation from one of our two dimensions. Adam died to the spiritual dimension when his spirit body lost the ability to interact with God in spirit. Physical death has the same result. We are dead when our physical body can no longer interact with our physical world. Death is separation, not non-existence. I do not believe the spirit body of Adam ceased to exist with death, but his spirit man was filled with the darkened void of separation from God. Adam's spiritual five senses would only experience the darkened void of spiritual separation. It is easy to think that being born again is an outdated religious idea popularized by President Jimmy Carter. But this is so far from the truth. What does it mean to be born again? To answer this question, we must return to the fall of Adam. All human flesh is born in the likeness and image of Adam. His fallen state became our natural birthright. The death that imprisoned the spirit of Adam is the same prison that enslaves us at birth. When Jesus admonished Nicodemus that we must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God, he was not using a religious metaphor to describe adherence to his new doctrine. Jesus understood that a new birth was necessary in order to restore our dead spiritual man to God's spiritual realm. Being born again means entering a new spiritual life filled with a new spiritual experience. A born-again man or woman is no longer chained to a one-dimensional experience, but now is open to a two-dimensional experience with God. Our human spirit that once was dead now comes alive to the presence of God. The divine nature has been implanted into our lifeless 
human spirit. We are the children of God, truly born again through the power of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Now that our human spirit is alive to God once again, our spiritual five senses can also receive stimulus from the spiritual dimension again. In regards to God, we are two-dimensional once again. We have two bodies capable of providing data stimulus. Having two bodies capable of providing stimulus does not mean we understand the stimulus coming through these input-output ports. This concept is confusing. How is it possible to be dual-dimensional at one time? Think for a moment. There are times when we sense the presence of God or hear His voice. During those moments when we interact with God, we allow both our physical and spiritual bodies to interact with their respective dimension. Simply stated, we are dual dimensional. The duty of our soul is to digest and interpret the stimulus coming from our physical and spiritual I.O. ports. This doesn't make sense. If our soul was designed by God to receive and process stimulus from our physical body and our spiritual body, then why don't I sense both dimensions? The fact is, our soul does receive these two types of stimulus, but we are blind and ignorant to the data received from our spiritual man. Since birth, we have trained our soul to be conscious of our physical body only. When we are born again, the light of God penetrates our human spirit. But our ability to perceive this radical change is dependent upon our willingness to experience the change. Sometimes we miss what we want to see because we are looking in the wrong direction. We frustrate our dual dimensional experience when we only trust the data received from our physical body. That old idiom fits here. I will believe it only when I see it. Maybe this attitude is the reason why we fail to experience the true spiritual things of God. We approach God with more unbelief than faith. Our soul is our central processing unit, but it also is the source of our free will. We choose either by ignorance or by personal volition the data stream we want to process. This choice is an act of our free will. We must choose to respond to both data streams. This action may sound simple, but it is not. It is easy to yield to the passions and lusts that come from our physical man, but it is a straight and narrow path that retrains our thought process to respond to the stimulus that comes from our spiritual man. This process is called discipleship, or, in other words, learning the discipline of Christ. 
Jesus made it clear that all of his disciples could hear his voice. Hearing the voice of Jesus does not necessarily mean that we respond to his voice. Hearing and response are two different things. Over the years, I have learned that our experiences with God will always follow the path of the cross. The cross of Christ is the data bus used by the Holy Spirit to channel the stimulus coming from God. Consider this thought. Should we be deaf to the voice of God, then maybe we need to seek after the cross of Christ in our soul, because the voice of God will always follow the path of the cross. The path of the cross seems to be a vague, cryptic concept. This phrase can cause confusion. Are we to follow a path of blood and death? In a metaphorical sense, yes, we are. Jesus taught that his disciples must take up their cross daily and follow him. Let's read. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Jesus clearly used the symbol of the cross he described as an important spiritual truth. To Jesus, the cross was much more than a physical device of execution. It was the will of God for his life. He knew that submission to God would result in a lonely walk to the bloody hill of Golgotha. Being a servant to the will of God was the path Jesus followed. It is the same path all disciples of Christ must follow. The death of Jesus on the cross was the ultimate manifestation of His obedience to God's redemptive plan. The cross that Jesus truly carried was the plan and will of His Father. The whole physical incarnation of Jesus was the path of the cross he would follow on a daily basis. The cross we must carry on a daily basis is the will of God for our lives. God has a plan and purpose for each and every one of us. As long as we embrace God's will, we embrace Jesus' cross, and God's voice will always follow the path of the cross. Jesus clarified why the will of God is the path of the cross when he called upon his disciples to embrace the need for self-denial. In other words, the path of the cross is the disciplined mind we develop in our walk with Jesus. To be a disciple of Christ, we must learn to deny our own self-interests in pursuit of the higher calling of following Jesus. We will not be able to follow Jesus and do the will of God until we learn to deny our own self-interests and desires.
we see the path of the cross in the first chapters of the book of Genesis. God clearly revealed his will to Adam. And this revelation created a cross for Adam to follow. When Adam rejected the will of God, he also rejected the path of the cross. The consequence of his rebellion resulted in his own spiritual death and the absence of God's voice. This principle has not changed since the days of Adam. Our obedience to the will of God is the path of the cross. When we embrace this path, the spiritual stimulus from God will flood our heart and soul. We are dual-dimensional creatures. Through our physical and spiritual bodies, we have access to each receptive dimension. God created man to be a living soul with the free will to love and serve. We, like Adam, also have a living soul, but Jesus brought a life-giving spirit. Even though this born-again experience caused us to become two-dimensional once again, we still must deal with the passions and lusts that chain our soul to this fallen human existence. And these human qualities can cloud our heart and mind. The Apostle Paul wrote, in the same way, we can see and understand only a little about God now, as if we were peering at His reflection in a poor mirror. But someday, we are going to see Him in His completeness, face to face. Now, all that I know is hazy and blurred, but then I will see everything clearly just as clearly as God sees into my heart right now. We can experience God through the arena of our human spirit. But these experiences must be channeled through the fog and haze of our own thoughts and passions. Even though we see and hear God through a haze of human passion, He is still there. Don't lose faith. The more we embrace the discipleship of Jesus Christ, the more we experience God. Just remember, should we wish to experience more of God, then follow the path of the cross.